Alistair. It is quite impossible to say whether this thing really happened. It depends entirely on the word of R. M. Haringey, who is an artist. Following his version of the affair, the narrative deposes that Haringey went into his studio about ten o'clock one morning to see what he could make of the head that he had been working at the day before. The head in question was that of an Italian organ grinder, and Haringey thought, but was not quite sure. That the title of the picture would be the Vigil. So far, he is frank, and his narrative bears the stamp of truth. He had seen the man expectant for pennies, and with a promptness that suggested genius, had had him in at once. Neil,、uh, look up at that bracket," said Haringey, as if you expected pennies. Don't grin. I don't want to paint your gums. Look as though you were unhappy. Now, after a night's rest, the picture proved decidedly unsatisfactory. It's good work," said Haringey. "That little bit in the neck, but." He walked about the studio and looked at the thing from this point and from that. A painting," he says. He said, "just a painting of an organ grinder, a mere portrait. If it were a live organ grinder, I wouldn't mind." But somehow I never make things alive. I wonder if my imagination is wrong. This too has a truthful air. His imagination is wrong. That creative touch, to take canvas and pigment and make a man as Adam was made of red ochre. But this thing, if you met it walking about the streets, you would know it was only a studio production. The little boys would tell it a garn ome and git frimed. Some little touch. Well, it won't do as it is. He gathered his palette and brushes from his table. Then he turned to the picture and put a speck of brown in the corner of the mouth, and shifted his attention thence to the pupil of the eye. Then he decided that the chin was a trifle too impassive for a vigil. Presently, he put down his impedimenta, and lighting a pipe, surveyed the progress of his work. I'm hanged if the thing isn't sneering at me," said Haringey, and he still believes it sneered. The animation of the figure had certainly increased, but scarcely in the direction he wished. There was no mistake about the sneer. Vigil of the unbeliever," said Haringey. Rather subtle and clever that, but the left eyebrow isn't cynical enough. He went and dabbed at the eyebrow, and added a little to the lobe of the ear to suggest materialism. Further consideration ensued. Vigil's off, I'm afraid," said Haringey. "Why not, Mephistopheles? But that's a bit too common. A friend of the Doge, not so seedy. The armour won't do though, too Camelot. How about a scarlet robe and call him one of the Sacred College?" Humour in that, and an appreciation of Middle Italian history. He describes himself as babbling in this way in order to keep down an unaccountably unpleasant sensation of fear. The thing was certainly acquiring anything but a pleasing expression, yet it was as certainly becoming far more of a living thing than it had been, if a sinister one, far more alive than anything he had ever painted before. Call it. Portrait of a gentleman," said Haringey. "A certain gentleman. <sighs> Won't do. Kind of thing they call bad taste. That sneer will have to come out. That gone and a little more fire in the eye. Never noticed how warm his eye was before, and he might do for、oh, what price? Passionate pilgrim." But that devilish face won't do this side of the channel. Some little inaccuracy does it. Eyebrows probably too oblique.
the face on the canvas seemed animated by a spirit of its own. Where the devilish expression came in, he found impossible to discover. Experiment was necessary. The eyebrows. It could scarcely be the eyebrows. But he altered them. No, that was no better. In fact, if anything, a trifle more satanic. The corner of the mouth? Ugh, more than ever a leer, and now retouched, it was ominously grim. The eye, then? Catastrophe. He had filled his brush with vermilion instead of brown, and yet he had felt sure it was brown. The eye seemed now to have rolled in its socket and was glaring at him an eye of fire. In a flash of passion, possibly with something of the courage of panic, he struck the brush full of bright red paint athwart the picture. And then a very curious thing, a very strange thing indeed occurred, if it did occur. The devilish Italian before him shut both his eyes, pursed his mouth, and wiped the colour off his face with his hand. Then the red eye opened again, with a sound like the opening of lips, and the face smiled. That was rather hasty of you, said the picture. Haringey states that now that the worst had happened, his self-possession returned. He had a saving persuasion that devils were reasonable creatures. Why do you keep moving about then, he said, making faces and all that, sneering and squinting while I'm painting you? I don't, said the picture. You do, said Haringey. It's yourself, said the picture. It's not myself, said Haringey. It is yourself, said the picture. No, don't go hitting me with paint again, because it's true. You have been trying to fluke an expression on my face all the morning. Really, you haven't an idea what your picture ought to look like. I have, said Haringey. You have not, said the picture. You never have with your pictures. You always start with the vaguest presentiment of what you are going to do. It is to be something beautiful, you are sure of that, and devout, perhaps, or tragic. But beyond that, it is all experiment and chance. <laughs> My dear fellow, you don't think you can paint a picture like that. Now, it must be remembered that for what follows, we have only Haringey's word. I shall paint a picture exactly as I like, said Haringey calmly. This seemed to disconcert the picture a little. You can't paint a picture without an inspiration, it remarked. But I had an inspiration for this. Inspiration, sneered the sardonic figure. A fancy that came from your seeing an organ grinder looking up at the window. Vigil! <laughs> you just started painting on the chance of something coming, that's what you did. And when I saw you at it, I came. I want to talk with you. Art with you, said the picture. It's a poor business. You potter. I don't know how it is, but you don't seem able to throw your soul into it. You know too much. It hampers you. In the midst of your enthusiasms, you ask yourself whether something like this has not been done before, and... Look here, said Haringey who had expected something better than criticism from the devil. Are you going to talk studio with me? He filled his number 12 hog's hair with red paint. The true artist, said the picture, is always an ignorant man. An artist who theorizes about his work is no longer artist but critic. Now Wagner... I say, what's that red paint for? I'm going to paint you out, said Haringey. I don't want to hear all that Tommy rot. One minute, said the picture, evidently alarmed. I want to make you an offer, a genuine offer. It's right what I'm saying. You lack inspirations. Well, no doubt you've heard of the Cathedral of Cologne and the Devil's Bridge and... Rubbish, said Haringey. Do you think I want to go to perdition simply for the pleasure of painting a good picture and getting it slated? Take that! His blood was up. So he planted a dab of vermilion in the creature's mouth. 
The Italian spluttered and tried to wipe it off. Evidently horribly surprised. And then, according to Haringey, there began a very remarkable struggle. Haringey splashing away with the red paint and the picture wriggling about and wiping it off as fast as he put it on. For a few minutes, nothing could be heard but the brush strokes and the spluttering and ejaculations of the Italian. Presently, the paint on the palette gave out, and the two antagonists stood breathless regarding each other. The picture was so smeared with red that it looked as if it had been rolling about a slaughterhouse. It was painfully out of breath and very uncomfortable with the wet paint trickling down its neck. Still, the first round was in its favour on the whole. Think, it said, sticking pluckily to its point, two supreme masterpieces in different styles. I know, said Haringey, and rushed out of the studio. In another minute he was back with a large tin of enamel. Hedge Sparrow's egg tint it was, and a brush. At the sight of that, the artistic devil with the red eye began to scream. Three masterpieces, culminating masterpieces. Haringey delivered a cut across the demon and followed with a thrust in the eye. There was an indistinct rumbling. Four masterpieces and a spitting sound. Haringey had the upper hand now and meant to keep it. With rapid, bold strokes, he continued to paint over the writhing canvas until at last it was a uniform field of shining hedge sparrow tint. Once the mouth reappeared and got as far as five master... before he filled it with enamel. At last, nothing remained save a gleaming panel of drying enamel. For a little while, a faint stirring beneath the surface puckered it slightly here and there. But presently, even that died away, and the thing was perfectly still. Then Haringey, according to Haringey's account, lit his pipe and sat down and stared at the enamelled canvas and tried to make out clearly what had happened. Then he walked round behind it to see if the back of it was at all remarkable. Then it was that he began to regret he had not photographed the devil before he painted him out. Temptation of Haringey by H.G. Wells was read by David McAllister, abridged by Madge Hart and produced by Pat McLaughlin. Tomorrow's story is called The Inexperienced Ghost. Next week on Radio 4 Extra, we have a rare and beautiful treat for you as the singer, actor and legendary Hollywood star Bing Crosby is the guest on Sounds Natural. In an interview with Derek Jones from 1976, Bing discusses his memories of childhood, how birdsong influenced his music and his enduring love of wildlife. The sort of magic of the great outside when you're out on an angling trip, if you hear a particular bird. A loon. Seldom see them and they're generally on the lakes up in the northwest. And it's an eerie sound, it's only at night. They come at night, and they're harmless, they're, they're nothing. But it's a, at night on a lake when there's no moon, and you hear that, ooh, ooh. It's a real lonely, eerie sound, and especially from a bird that you, I don't recall ever.